Approximately 150,000 students attended 80 different schools across Canada. There were approximately 130 residential schools. We sat down with Professor Shirley Williams of the Bird Clan of the Ojibwe and Ottawa First Nations, who attended an all-girls residential school in Spanish, Ontario. But they said they wanted to have the school built on the reserve, where they could see the children come home and after. But they wouldn't allow that because there was no money, no money for teachers, no money for the school. So this was the best uh, thing that they could do was to send the kids away. But uh, the mothers said that the, um, the great white father or the great white mother thinks that uh, we don't know how to look after our own children and they want to take the children away, so send the children away. And they want to send the children away because, uh, because we're bad. Once you got to the school, uh, they took everything away from you, uh, including your clothes that you wore. You had to change your clothes. Um, what they selected for you. Um, and everything that they, um, my mother prepared, like comics and things that the, the girls would need or whatever, um, they took those away too. And including your own shoes, they give you your shoes and their um, other clothing that you needed to wear. And when you got there, is um, there was an assembly line. Um, and they would ask you, what's your name? My parents and my sisters prepared me questions and I memorized them. So first question is, uh, what's your name? So I was very proud to say my name is Shirley Fessing. And um, <clears throat> you became a thing, not, um, not by call by, by your name. And then you were, yeah, they took all of your identity yes, away. When, when I entered to school, to residential school, my father said, um, remember who you are. No matter what they do to you in there, be strong. Don't forget your language and uh, come back and teach us about the Inanak. I never learned about the Inanak. So when I went back to school, to university, just what I was learning was about the Inanak. I was doing so good that I continued on and graduated with a BA. And then um, everything pointed out to teaching the language and that. And uh, 1992, I went back to school. I was still working at the university. And I got my MES, Master's in Environmental Studies, here at York. And then before that, when I got hired to teach language and culture at uh, Trent University, um, I saw this little ad in the paper and it says, um, uh, Native Language Instructors Program, and I've never taught the language, and, and so I thought there's, you know, there's difference between learning how to speak the language and learning how to teach the language. So, um, because I was hired to teach the language, I had to know how do I teach univers in a university with the students and that. So I went back to school um, to teach to learn. Uh, about orthography and methods in teaching. Hi, my name is Geronimo Henry. I'm from Six Nations. And I was a, uh, my clan is Bear Clan, and I'm uh, from the Cuga Nation. And uh, I spent 11 years here at this residential school. And uh, I'm going to take you guys for a tour today and tell you about the school. This first, uh, first level here, it's all like uh, there was a, a girls' school uh, on on the right, and on the left was the the boys' school school rooms, and in the middle was kind of like where the staff and the well the offices were, and then the second floor was for like the the dormitories. So on uh, the on the left hand side is like the the boys' lower dorm, and in the middle here was uh, where the staff stayed to keep us apart. But we never, we were always kind of hungry here, so. And they had, like, back here, they had, like, a, a city, city dump. You know? And uh, once that started to open up, we actually got going down there, like, right after school, we'd all run down there and uh, dig in the dump for something to eat. And back, uh, back behind us, that museum here, they had, right to that fence and right to Mohawk Street there, they had, like, a garden. 
Yeah, they had garden, they had all the vegetables and that. And back here, I remember that one year we had, uh, there was about maybe 15 or maybe 10 acres of potatoes. Yeah, and they had like a root cellar right here where those picnic tables are, right there. They had a great big building there. It was like a, a root cellar. Put all the vegetables, all the turnips and, you know, cabbage and potatoes down cellar. There was a lot of like uh, emotions in there when they put their names on there too, or, or sometimes maybe they, might even put their, their dad's name or their mom's name on there. Well, this looks pretty old here. But I didn't even know which way was which way home was, you know, when I was here. Because I got here when I was like five years old or something. Five and a half or... Yeah. And here was just... Uh, it was just 15 miles away. I could have ran home, like, you know. The government believed the only way to teach Aboriginal people the proper ways was through removing children from their families and forcing them to attend all-day live-in residential schools run by Anglican, United, Roman Catholic and Presbyterian churches. We spoke on the phone with a representative from the United Church who agreed to speak with us in regards to the church's involvement in the residential school system. The churches uh, encourage the government to make an apology. We, there are several delegations of churches, church uh, representatives went and met with the Minister of Indian Affairs, and we, we, we talked with other government officials recommending that the government make an apology. On June 11, 2008, Stephen Harper stood on the Senate floor in front of five leaders from different Aboriginal communities and six residential school survivors to deliver a long-awaited apology, which was broadcast from coast to coast. I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. We met up with Wayne K. Spears at his Toronto home to discuss the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. He worked with the foundation for 13 years. He has also written a book, Full Circle, a story of the Indian residential school legacy, and is currently a journalist for the Huffington Post. And that it, there wasn't going to be any funding for the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Their argument, this is the conservative government of Stephen Harper, their argument was that we'll provide funding for this. It will be administered by the federal government, principally by Health Canada, um, and to a lesser degree, Indian Affairs. Our argument was that the, pri the paramount reason that the Aboriginal Healing Foundation model was better was that it was putting the decisions, putting the power into the hands of the community, people who were in the residential schools, that their children grew up with the influence of that system, and they knew better than anyone um, how they suffered as a result and, and what they needed to do. But there was also a practical principle at stake, which is that the residential school system was paternalistic and took people's power away from them and put them under the Indian Act. And this was something that was moving in the opposite direction, back towards the idea of self-sustaining, self-nurturing, self-developing communities. And here was the government saying, well, we really believe in the work that the Aboriginal Healing Foundation is doing. And they did say that there, there were no voices of dissent, and yet Strangely, here they were taking back control and taking back the design and the resources. So, well, that's the wrong direction. That's the direction that we've had all along under the Indian Act. Uh, can we say objectively that things are better, things are worse, things are the same? Well, I, I think that point of view was sharply divided. I, I interviewed people who said, I said the 98 apology was transformative. Jane Stewart made a huge difference in their lives as a survivor. The, pre the Prime Minister's apology, uh, people who feel that the culture is coming back, the languages, not just the cultures, but the languages, the pride, healing matters. It's, or that's why forgiveness matters and having things like apology. When the government apologized, people could begin to forgive. 
And um, I think that even though the Aboriginal Healing Foundation wasn't refunded, even though there is less attention to this from politicians and so on, Bob Watts said to me when I interviewed him, he was par part of um, part of this uh, settlement agreement negotiation. He said, for me, truth and reconciliation and healing, it's not about the Prime Minister and the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations having a hug fest on Parliament Hill. It's about the person who, for the first time in his life, he, maybe in his 60s or 70s, tells his daughter that I love you. And that's the first time she hears that. <laughs>